Um, good afternoon. My name is Yoshi Sagara. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute of Geoeconomics and also the Asia Pacific Initiative, which is based in the International House of Japan. And so I'm, it's very really honor and a pleasure to be moderating this conversation on Quad for the Indo-Pacific. So our focus in this panel is to talk about recent efforts of the Quad to expand its outreach uh, to like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. So the global strategic and the geoeconomic environment is changing rapidly. This has impacted countries in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. And so, as we have heard from the Quad foreign ministers, the Quad is committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific that is inclusive and resilient. So Quad aims to achieve the Indo-Pacific region that is peaceful, prosperous, stable, secure, and free from intimidation and coercion. So in short, Kuwait um, is expected, well, Kuwait should be a benefit all countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so, um, however, there continue to be concerns that the Kuwait is an exclusive partnership. So I think we do need a debate here and I think uh, we have wonderful panelists today. So this session will discuss the state of recent efforts of Kuwait for its outreach and the synergy with other countries and the regional institution. And um, you may have heard um, African very famous proverb uh, to illustrate the importance of inclusiveness. If you want to go first, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So this proverb is so popular that in Japan, so that Prime Minister Kishida uh, even referred to this proverb during his policy speech. So how the Kuwait can go together with like-minded countries and regional institutions and the stakeholders in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. And we will discuss potential partnerships and collaborations with other groups and also through this panel discussion, I'm hoping to identify the core value and the competitive strengths of the Quad. So uh, to do so, uh, we have a panel of very esteemed experts joining us today. Uh, so I just briefly introduce them. Uh, the first is Ambassador Anil Suklau. Uh, Ambassador Suklau is Brick Sherpa uh, of South Africa and ambassador at large for Asia and the BRICS. And the next is Mr. Shanakian Razamanikam. Uh, Mr. Razamanikam is the member of parliament in Sri Lanka. And the next is Ms. Haley Chana. Uh, Haley is the director of economic security at the US Studies Center in Australia. And the next is Professor Kim Hunchan. Uh, Professor Kim is the distinguished professor uh, uh, in the uh, Korea, uh, Korea University in the Republic of Korea. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Lin Kwak. Uh, Lin is the visiting professor at the Georgetown University. Uh, thank you for joining us. So first, um, I will start by asking a couple of questions to all panelists. Um, do you agree that the quote is exclusive? I think it's quite a debatable, um, provocative question. But the first question is that, do you agree that the Quad is exclusive? And is Quad required to expand its outreach to like-minded countries or other groups? And what are your views on potential partnerships between Quad and other countries, including South Korea, Sri Lanka, South Africa, and also plurilateral? or regional or even mini lateral groups in and around the Indo-Pacific. So on these questions, so first I will turn it over to the speakers uh, to make a uh, very brief opening comments. So first, Ambassador Sukla, please. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Minister Jay Shankar, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, panelists. 
Thank you, Minister, for that broad sweep of what uh, Quad is and within the context of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as an African, South African, I see myself as an outsider looking in. We are not part of the Quad. When you ask the question, is the Quad exclusive? I'm not sure how you define the term exclusive, what you're looking at, whether you're looking at the membership or whether you're looking at the substantive issues the Quad deal with. Because what I found is uh, in Minister Jay Shankar's uh, speech, as well as the uh, leaders document of the Quad last year, as well as the foreign ministers, a great deal of synergy on the issues that the Quad deal with and Agenda 2063 of the African Union. But I want to pose certain questions uh, to you colleagues uh, from an African perspective. Firstly, when you look at the Indo-Pacific and as Minister rightfully pointed out, there's, I think, about 14 strategy documents, outlooks, or white papers, which includes also three regional bodies, the European Union, uh, ASEAN, and IORA, that have put out an outlook or strategy on the Indo-Pacific. Now, within the IPEF, the question I'm going to ask is, IPEF, IPEF has 14 members. Now, amongst those 14 members, some do not consider the USA in particular, when you look at the USA's definition of the Indo-Pacific, it doesn't include the east coast of Africa. The 13 littoral states of Africa is excluded. It goes up to India. That's the geographical definition, Minister, of how the USA sees it. A geography, Africa, is again marginalized. A question I put this past week, there was a bipartisan congressional de delegation visiting South Africa. And I was asked to, they asked for an address on BRICS, on China, Africa, and on the Indo-Pacific. The question I posed to them is, when you invited countries to become part of IPEF, why no African country? Of that 14, Africa is totally absent. And you have 13 littoral states from the Indian Ocean, which we consider as part of the geography of the Indo-Pacific. Secondly, if you look at the security of the Indo-Pacific, and you don't include Africa, you will never have security in the Indo-Pacific. Security is interdependent, integrated today. And these are questions I'd like us to reflect on, including the Quad think tank. All of you have good bilateral relations with the African continent, with the member states of Africa. But why the continued marginalization of Africa on a major construct, the Indo-Pacific? No African presence. Secondly, if you look at how we evolved the Indo-Pacific outlook of IORA, it was South Africa. We put forward the idea when we chaired IORA in 2017, 2019. I wrote that concept document that introduced it. And of the 22 member states, the majority said, no, why do we need an Indo-Pacific outlook for IORA? It took us a year to convince colleagues that we need this outlook. And that was eventually adopted in 2022 at the ministerial in Bangladesh. Now, India chaired that, uh, that, that process. And we have, I believe, a very good document that also helps us as Africa. Because I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm also pointing fingers at the African continent. Because as Africa, we haven't taken seriously the concept of the Indo-Pacific and its implications for the African continent within the context of the wider, wider global community. Now, I wrote an article that's been published in September last year in the Journal of Indian Ocean Rim Association that provides the genesis of how we evolved the IORA Indo-Pacific uh, outlook. And within that, I also postulate some partnerships with all of the countries present here, including India, Australia, USA, UK, South Korea, Japan, as well as the EU and ASEAN, on partnerships that we can forge in terms of the synergies between the IORA outlook and the white papers or strategies put out by the respective countries. We live in an age of minilateralism. I think that's a reality. That's how I see the evolution of the Quad and many other such bodies that are, are propping up. And that's because we have rendered the multilateral architecture almost paralyzed. But we also live in an age of multi-alignment and realignment. And this is natural in terms of the security architecture that we find ourselves in. 
Now, one of the things we wrote in through the IORA Indo-Pacific Outlook is that the Indo-Pacific must adopt Resolution 2832, the Unga Resolution of 1971, that was sponsored by Sri Lanka, declaring the Indian Ocean as a zone of peace, including the space above and the seabed below. And I think we need to see how we extend this from the Indian Ocean into the Indo-Pacific, because the Indo-Pacific is the theater of contestation, and all of these many lateral fora that are being created are looking at how we can work together and collaborate. I say this is a positive development, but it has to be inclusive. And I, um, my last point would be that you cannot leave out Africa. And I think this is something we all need to relook going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for the strong statement. Um, um, so next, uh, can I ask uh, your views, Mr. Uh, Lazamani Khan from Sri Lanka? Thank, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and external affairs minister. Um, in fact, uh, about your question about uh, COD being exclusive, I think uh, we need to focus on uh, COD countries uh, having uh, a far more inclusive uh, approach, uh, in my opinion. Now, if you take my country for an example, uh, Sri Lanka, Honorable Foreign Minister Mr. Jay Shankar is very well aware of Sri Lanka. He has been a close friend and has worked in Sri Lanka as a in the foreign service as well. So he's fully aware and it has, it has always ensured that that happens that even within Sri Lanka, inclusiveness is, there are many other groups, not just the government, um, who would like to work with Quad. Um, if you look at uh, successive governments in Sri Lanka, they've always uh, carried out projects that have been counterproductive to the Indo-Pacific uh, the Indo-Pacific region. If you look at the governments elected from 2010, 15 and 20, I'm sure everybody knows the controversial Hambantot report. Uh, from 2010, um, the government took unnecessary debt. 2015, the new government handed over the Hambantot report to another country. And 2020, it happened with Port City. But if you, that is mostly all these projects come from the southern part of Sri Lanka. But if you look at the north and the east, there are different groups who are in line, far more in line with, genuinely in line with COD's principles. Now, um, there are some certain political parties uh, in fact, the party that I represent, uh, we mostly um, are the elected representatives of the northern and the eastern parts of Sri Lanka. So our people's security concerns are in line with India's security concerns as well, because we are closer to Tamil Nadu than we are to Colombo. If you take Jaffna, the northern part of Sri Lanka, we are closer to Tamil Nadu than to Colombo. So our security, our pe in the security concerns of our people are very much in line with uh, the security concerns of uh, India as well. And if you look at places of strategic importance in the north and the east of Sri Lanka, they have been secure. If you look at the Trincomalee uh, port, it has been secure. But that is also because wider groups that exist within many countries, I'm just using Sri Lanka as an example because that's the country that I represent. I think more inclusion from Cod countries uh, work on further uh, strengthening relationships with non-government participants or non-government parties also could be a way for inclusion so that uh, you know the overall the indo-pacific's uh, interests are strengthened and um, this is also coming from for us um, this is also coming from a um, concern about uh, livelihood for the people in the north and east uh, from the people uh, that i represent so even if you look at the most recent economic crisis that we had it is the quad countries that came forward uh, and especially india uh, with the $4 billion uh, worth of assistance, which is what stopped chaos uh, in the country happening. But right now, uh, our, my country is a good example for, uh, you know, for COD countries to use with other uh, countries that engage about being genuine about working with, uh, for governments to be genuine about working uh, along with COD principles or COD uh, ideology. Because um, even right now, we are in IMF program where the debt restructuring is to happen. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is one country uh, not agreeing uh, for debt restructuring. I don't think I need to mention uh, name drop any countries, but you know the debt restructuring process is uh, deciding the fate of 22 million uh, Sri Lankans. So this is a good example for all other countries as well on uh, the uh, importance of closer cooperation with COD countries. And, and I would like to re-emphasize on the fact that 
there are other groups. You know, the government is not only the only group uh, that the COD could engage with, and the COD countries do engage with other groups, but I think further, further engagement could strengthen it. Uh, if you look at uh, the US, uh, Japan, Australia, these countries are uh, primarily, uh, have been development partners in Sri Lanka on issues with human rights and democracy. They have been strong pillars to countries like Sri Lanka. So I think on these principles, uh, I, my closing remarks would be that there are many groups uh, who are looking forward for closer engagement and closer cooperation to ensure the Indo-Pacific region uh, is safer and is uh, and and the the interests of all these countries align together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, like me, international relations scholar tend to think quite state-centric um, perspective. But I think it's great to hear the views from Sri Lanka. Um, so, Heidi. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you, Yoshi, and thank you very much to ORF for what I do believe is quite a provocative session. Um, I would like to just say quickly that I used to be an official within the Australian government. Um, I'm not anymore, and I speak for myself. Um, and when you hear what I have to say, you'll realise why I got kicked out. Um, but what I wanted to express about this is that um, the session here where it asks about whether or not the Quad is exclusive. The word exclusive grouping has been used by China in all of its public messaging to undermine the Quad. And Chinese public messaging is very effective at conveying this, what I think is a false message. The reason China is so effective is because there is some truth to what China says. The quad is exclusive in the sense that the word quad means four countries. Um, anytime you add more countries to that, it is no longer a quad. That's when you have a multilateral agreement. And I really uh, don't appreciate the quad plus language because I think uh, anytime you say quad plus, it becomes a loaded term because of what Beijing has done to the quad brand. Um, so I think we should be moving away from using quad plus. Um, it's important to say that we're working with other countries in the region. We did this with the quad, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine where we worked with New Zealand, South Korea and Vietnam, talking with them about COVID vaccines. Um, but I also think that there's a danger in uh, equating the quad with a panacea for all of the region's problems. You know, quad countries can and do work with all the other countries in the region on shared solutions for things. And we shouldn't keep la uh, layering things on top of the quad because you really do raise expectations uh, like we did with the COVID vaccine commitment and you, risk, you run the risk of uh, failing to meet those commitments. Um, I also wanted to just touch on the fact that, you know, you have another grouping in the world, NATO, and even though NATO is exclusive, you have these partners called Enhanced Opportunities Partners, and Australia is one of them. And so there are always options to work with groups. Uh, China is just uh, peddling this message that it's an exclusive grouping. So I'll leave my comments there. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think comparing to NATO is uh, quite interesting and um, that we have um, quite a wide rooms to cooperate with other like-minded countries. And I think it's now great to hear the views from Korea. So Professor Kim. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for the, having me. Uh, this uh, quad and uh, also quad uh, Regina and the Regina quad uh, forum. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Sagara asked the, uh, the two things about the exclusiveness of Quad and also potential partnership. Uh, when it comes to the exclusiveness, uh, uh, I think that uh, it's an all group and all, all circle is uh, exclusive from the outsider's view. Okay, so Quad is uh, no exception; it's exclusive. So the important thing is that um, uh, if the, uh, the outsiders uh, think that there is not exclusive. Uh, that it, it depends on the, uh, the members and attitude and uh, our way of the, uh, uh, running the system and, uh, and other things. Uh, uh, today morning, I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, Japanese ambassadors uh, to India as very I mean, eloquent and speech. And uh, he, uh, he uh, quote the, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, criteria on quote. Uh, uh, the first one is the common value. Uh, how much I mean, the uh, member countries share the common value, and second one is the common strategic interest. 
I think there is very, very important the criteria, and uh, we need to bear in mind uh, when we are talking about uh, the course. Suppose that um, you are a college student, and you are walking the uh, through the, uh, the common room, and then uh, uh, a people, uh, your friends, uh, like-minded people are talking about uh, something uh, in the, in, in the, the, uh, with the coffee, and their, their topic is something about uh, how, to, how to prepare the exam. So this, uh, you share the common interest with them. So you join the, uh, the, uh, the, the peoples and are talking about the, uh, the, uh, the information, sharing information. Uh, there is the, uh, the, uh, the things that um, the quad should, uh, should be learning. Okay? If you just I mean, uh, uh, go to the another room and then close the door, and sometimes I mean, lock, uh, lock the door, and uh, you are talking about something, something. And so this is the exclusiveness that the, from the outside view. And then if the, uh, the college is as like this, uh, nobody would argue that um, this college is atmosphere is uh, free and open, okay? So if you support the uh, free and open in the Pacific, your organization should be also very free uh, and open to the, uh, the any issues, open to the any members, and the, the, the only reason, the only criteria for the, uh, the, the choosing the membership is uh, what I'm uh, again arguing that the common interest and common value, okay? So the potential partnership you are asking, the second question, so what I'm saying is very easy. Just uh, follow the two criteria, what the, the Abe, uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, the late, I mean the Abe Shinjo argued. That's very important, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, from Japan's perspective, um, I think uh, we have need to do more. Um, so we will discuss later. So well, last, but, last but not least, uh, Lin, please. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to address uh, the issue about um, the, the issues arising from the Quad from a Southeast Asian perspective. So that's um, where I'm coming from. But first, let me begin by thanking um, Samir as well as the rest of the ORF team uh, for the invitation to the Ricina Dialogue, but also to this Quad um, Forum. Um, it's an amazing and energetic team and they've been tireless in their work on um, these two uh, venues, on, on these two platforms. I think I first attended the 2019 Ricina Dialogue and since then I've seen um, the dialogue grow from strength to strength um, in lockstep uh, with uh, India's increasing prominence on the world stage. So I appreciate being here. Um, on whether or not the Quad is exclusive, I think this is sometimes raised as a prob problem, but if we look at it from the perspective of Southeast Asia, um, their concerns around the Quad are centered around three main factors. First, what the Quad means for ASEAN centrality. Second, whether um, it forces countries in Southeast Asia to choose sides. And third, whether it provokes uh, China. Now, of course, whether or not it's an exclusive grouping or not is part of it, but I don't think that's the fundamental reason why China is concerned um, with the Quad. And in fact, the larger it is, potentially, the more problems it might cause for China. So I think, if we're looking to, if the Quad is looking to broaden and deepen relationships with uh, Southeast Asia, um, the concerns that I highlighted are the ones that the Quad should have regard to, and um, whether or not it should expand its formal membership um, is less relevant. Uh, you also asked um, about the current state of Quad engagement in Southeast Asia. And I think the Quad's move from non uh, from security uh, related issues to non security or security adjacent functions has uh, been very positively received in Southeast Asia or at least its policy community. Um, a recent poll, and by recent I mean 2023, that's the latest poll by the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, uh, reflects that 69% or 70% of respondents viewed cooperation with the Quad as beneficial for the region um, or complementing ASEAN's own efforts in the region. So this is very positive, especially when we look at an older poll. And, and so the, the first, um, so when the question of the Quad was first um, posed in 
um, the same poll I'm talking about, that was in 2020. And in that poll, less than half of respondents uh, responded that um, the Quad had a positive or very positive impact on regional security, with the majority saying either that it had a very negative, a negative or no impact whatsoever. Now, that was a different question. That was about, you know, the impact on regional security as opposed to whether or not there should be cooperation with the Quad. But I think if we, if, um, if I am able to compare it with the conversations that I've had with diplomats and senior officials in the region, I think um, the results of the polls do match. So in other words, there is increasing receptivity to the Quad in Southeast Asia. Um, there was a very good um, article by uh, Dhruva Jayashankar as well as Tanvi Maidan on the Quad in 2022 in Foreign Affairs. And that article, in fact, argued that the Quad needs a harder edge and it's time for it to prioritize its security agenda. Um, I think it's fair to say that this will not be uh, well received in Southeast Asia. Uh, we've seen initial worries that the Quad would be divisive for the region calm down in Southeast Asia and hence this greater receptivity towards the Quad. Um, but if it re-securitized its agenda, I think that won't be well received. That said, I recognize that there might be tensions uh, between the Quad's objectives of ensuring a free and, Indo uh, free and open Indo-Pacific in the face of Chinese challenges on the one hand, and working with its more skittish partners in the region to do so on the other. And it may well be that Southeast Asia and other potential partners, or how they feel, how Southeast Asia and its, um, how Southeast Asia feels about the reintroduction of a harder edge to the Quad might be re less relevant to the Quad's ultimate goal of staving off the Chinese uh, challenge in the region. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Oh, sorry, one final point on partnership with ASEAN. So the Quad can engage with Southeast Asian countries bilaterally, or it can also seek to engage um, ASEAN as a whole. Um, there is at present no formal uh, partnership between ASEAN and the Quad. However, all four members of the Quad are all ASEAN dialogue partners. So there is nothing stopping the four countries um, engaging ASEAN as a whole on um, any program put forward. That said, of course, it would be without the Quad branding. Um, but that might not necessarily be a problem given that the provenance of such cooperation uh, would be clear. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, so we are discussing quite a range of issues. And actually, um, I will ask a question to Professor Kim. Um, so as Lim mentioned, I think partnership with ASEAN countries uh, or Southeast Asian countries is uh, kind of Quad can work together with Korea. Because I understand South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy, um, I think it specifically mentioned um, the collaboration on uh, partnership with ASEAN countries. So do you see any potential ideas or collaboration uh, to uh, collaborate with Quad works and also jointly with the South Koreans outreach to the region? Yes, of course. ASEAN is a, a very, very important region, and then we, I think that we need to respect the, the ASEAN centrality. And then uh, foreign, foreign minister also talk about the, the, you know, the, the importance of the ASEAN and the ASEAN centrality, centrality as well. And so in the Indo-Pacific areas, and the, to preserve the pre and open Indo-Pacific ocean, ocean initiatives that I heard that in India raised, then uh, we need to uh, talk more about, uh, about many issues with ASEAN. And so I think that the Quad is uh, one of the best, I mean, uh, group and idea uh, to talk about the, uh, the many issues with ASEAN. So uh, as uh, the Korean uh, participants, uh, I think that uh, uh, Korea would be very happy to talk about many issues together with Quad, together with ASEAN, because the Korea ASEAN, uh, we think that um, uh, we have many, many, uh, we share many, many value and also interest uh, with ASEAN countries. Uh, so if the, uh, the Quad uh, can be a, a stepping stone to talk about these issues in a more open and free uh, level uh, in the Indo-Pacific areas, I think the concept of Indo-Pacific, uh, this concept would be more materialized than, the, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, appear more formally. So I think, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think uh, we have many areas uh, we can work together. So my next question is Mr. Lazamanikam. So you touched up on the uh, domestic uh, um, issue and which is uh, quite linked to in the Pacific Ocean because of the geopolitics and the geoeconomics uh, factor of your country. So from your view, how can the Quad be better uh, demonstrating that it serves the shared aspirations uh, of countries like Sri Lanka uh, in the region, and also what kind of priorities or what kind of activities should be taken by Quad? So what's your expectation to Quad? Well, I think in my initial uh, uh, intervention itself, I did mention a few, but uh, going further from that, I think it's the, the countries that engage with Quad. So the main four countries, uh, you know, people, room, people in this room, part of this think tank, understand the priorities and understand the need for Quad countries to work together and understand the need for uh, further engagement with other countries. But I think the countries that are under risk, I think the Quad countries or these initiatives should be taken right to the people. The citizens of these countries need to understand the importance of Quad countries working together to overcome the challenges. Because um, sometimes it's, um, you know, it's in a more diplomatic level, it's accepted. People have, people can comprehend uh, the issues and people can foresee uh, the issues that could come up in the future. But in terms of public, I think public awareness on the impact, the uh, adverse impacts of um, Chinese influence or other influence is absolutely essential. So forums like this must be taken all the way back into countries uh, where wider engagement uh, is required to educate the public on uh, the future impact. So I think uh, working with groups, and I think one of the activities is Probably awareness is something that is absolutely essential and that is something um, that can be worked on. And when I say awareness, it's mostly with the countries that the COD engages with, especially in the in the Pacific, smaller countries. Um, you know, the threats are, you know, not seen as, not seen so uh, severely uh, by general public. So I think uh, any form of uh, advocacy work that can be taken right to uh, the public is something that, uh, an activity that uh, the COD group can actually focus on. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, we now heard from the views from South Korea and Sri Lanka. So um, I'd like to ask Lin and Heidi uh, on how the Quad side can respond uh, to their views. So um, how can the Quad better demonstrate uh, that it serves the shared aspiration of the region? And what do you think? What should be the priorities or what kind of activities uh, should be prioritized? Um, so uh, can I start from Lin? On your question about um, how the Quad can better demonstrate that it understands the aspirations of the regions and wants to work together with it, I, I think actually the Quad has been reasonably sensitive uh, to the concerns and aspirations of Southeast Asia. For one thing, in terms of its description of itself, that has evolved over time to um, its support, not just of a free and open Indo-Pacific, but one that is stable and prosperous, and the, the region does care about prosperity, um, as well as one that is inclusive. Um, and that mention of inclusivity, of course, is um, important to Southeast Asia because of concerns about how China might respond. Um, but it's also been sensitive to um, ASEAN and its place in the region. And so uh, I think Southeast Asia was very reassured when the Quad committed to ASEAN's regional leadership as well as um, uh, stating that the Quad's work was aligned with ASEAN's principles and priorities. And so on priorities and actions that the Quad can take vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the region, I think that's pretty easy. We need only look at the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which sets out four priority areas for the region, namely maritime cooperation, connectivity, including digital uh, connectivity, 
the UN Sustainable Goals, as well as economic, including trade uh, cooperation. So in principle, that's very clear. Of course, the devil lies in the details. And so I think, you know, figuring out where we can have specific areas of cooperation will be very useful. And that will entail discussions with ASEAN and ASEAN member states about specific uh, projects to work, um, to work on. And I think in this respect, um, the onus is also on ASEAN and ASEAN countries in terms of coming up with a list of where um, it would most helpfully, um, it, it might most welcome um, uh, assistance on specific projects. Because I remember um, in the last few months meeting a Korean official, in fact, who said, you know, we have our Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, we want to engage with Southeast Asia more. We care about ASEAN centrality, but how do we show that we care about ASEAN centrality? What projects can we potentially work with? And so I think it, um, ASEAN needs to move from the general in terms of broad areas of priorities to the specific in terms of uh, suggesting actual projects to work on. Um, and I think we've seen I talked earlier about how you know the Quad has gained a certain momentum um, in the region, and now more countries are in the region are more positive about the Quad. Um, but it's going to be. Um, I think that part was easy because you know it's about dispelling fears about what the Quad means for ASEAN centrality and how China might respond. But moving forward on a positive agenda and delivering on that positive agenda um, by clear deliverables, I think that will be the next uh, challenge uh, for the Quad because the last thing I think the Quad wants is for the region to be less worried about the Quad because it's simply irrelevant. Yeah, so how to make the Quad relevant is a quite challenging issue, and I think the operationalization is, I think, the key. So, um, Haiti, you mentioned the um, uh, kind of the, a, a, I don't want to say propaganda, but kind of a strategic communication activities by China. So, but how Quad can be responding to that kind of Chinese um, actions or outreach, and how can Quad be better operationalizing, so what kind of priorities and activities we should take? Well, I first want to say that I think the Quad is a fantastic initiative, but I think it has a real public relations problem. And the problem it has is that it is trying to do too many things at once. Um, by saying that it's going to deliver a free and open Indo-Pacific, first of all, free and open for whom? And what does that actually look like in practical terms? And because it is trying to do everything, everywhere, all at once, it is very difficult to sell the benefits of the Quad, and particularly so when it makes large announcements like the one billion vaccine, COVID vaccine commitment, and then falls short of that commitment, um, it's sort of failing before it's even out of the gate. So I would really suggest that people that are working on the Quad, that less is more, and that you can actually brand the quad um, by actually focusing it around a fewer number of things than it is currently doing. So I know that the quad has six different leaders level working groups. It has more than a dozen working groups on all these other different topics. And you can imagine the complexities of trying to align four countries, let alone the individual agencies in each of those countries. I mean, I used to um, have responsibility for the Quad when I worked in government, and I also attended some Five Eyes meetings of um, Australia, United States, um, UK, and New Zealand, and Canada. And one of the most difficult challenges of the Five Eyes meetings was just finding a time of day that worked for all five countries to meet. Like, the coordination challenges are extreme, and that's just one small example of scheduling a meeting. So how can the Quad actually focus down and tell the region what it will deliver and what things should it focus on when there are so many priorities? Well, the way you do that is you have to follow three different um, lines of effort. The first is that the cooperation between the... Uh, the cooperation between the Quad countries has to make sense. You know, why are these four countries cooperating? The second is that it needs to be urgent for the region. It needs to be an urgent need. And the third is that it does need to be less provocative because we don't want the Quad to exacerbate the tensions and the conflict already in the region. So what three areas of the current agenda of the Quad fit those three criteria? They are infrastructure, supply chains, and critical technology. 
And then those three areas themselves are vast. Just think about the infrastructure pillar. I mean, China has had its Belt and Road for a decade and we're just coming to this party now. And in fact, it shows you that we can work better individually via the COVID um, vaccine commitment because our quad countries actually delivered more COVID vaccines themselves individually than they were able to deliver as a quad. So sometimes we should just be doing these things by ourselves because the coordination challenges are so extreme. So in terms of those three areas, and that's where I'll finish, on infrastructure, what kind of infrastructure should the quad countries cooperate on? I've suggested that it should be undersea cables um, because of the amount of data that's carried under undersea cables. 95% of the world's communications go through undersea cables. Um, on supply chains, I think the obvious um, contenders are semiconductors and batteries. And then on critical technology, I think it should be cooperation on the 5G rollout um, because 5G and other digital connectivity underpins all other technology. It might not sound like a typical critical technology, but for lots of countries in the region and further afield, it is critical. So those are the key things. And if the Quad could actually deliver something, it would be able to hang its hat on that thing. Thank you so much. So I think as we've already discussed, so um, Quad has um, um, quite much of potentials, but I think uh, also we need to learn from other um, regional um, institutions or like-minded groups. So that's um, my question to Ambassador Suklau. Um, thank you for your patience, because actually so my question is on BRICS. And so now the topic is that Kuwait is seen as exclusive um, from uh, some members, some states or countries. And now, as we know, now BRICS is expanding and BRICS is showing that it's inclusive. So I'm just curious that um, as a like-minded group, what Kuwait can learn from BRICS? Uh, so by becoming more inclusive, uh, what BRICS is aiming to achieve what what can learn from BRICS. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. I think uh, that's a difficult comparison. <clears throat> BRICS is a grouping of the global south. And as I've said, in this era of new alignment, multi-alignment, there's a gray area where previously you would not find countries of the north getting into a configuration of countries of the south. What we are seeing in the Quad is unique, where you have India as a developing country in partnership with three developed countries. I think that's a welcome development. We need to breach these divides between the North and the South. And I think this is a debate that is already taking place within BRICS. You would have seen last year, President Macron was very keen to attend the summit in Johannesburg. But I think BRICS is still about the global South at the moment but perhaps there will come a time, and I hope there will come a time when we can dialogue with countries of, of the North as well. Uh, in keeping with, with the theme of Raisina, there's no other alternative. We need to talk to each other, even if we have different perspectives of how we see the various challenges that we have to confront on the global stage. But I think the Quad has a low hanging fruit where it can interact because as the Quad uh, summit outcome document of, of last year, and also the foreign minister's statement. You acknowledge that one of the regional organizations that you can work with is IORA within the Indo-Pacific. Now, if you take the four Quad members, two of them are member states of IORA, Australia and India, and two are dialogue partners, the USA and Japan. So all of you are present in IORA, and what we are saying within the IORA Indo-Pacific outlook, the focus must be on development and cooperation. And I think the previous speaker mentioned, we need to look at some practical deliverables that impacts on addressing the fundamental challenges we as developing countries face in terms of poverty, underdevelopment, and in inequality. And I think this is where the Quad, whether you do it as Quad or whether you do it as individual members that are part of IORA, the IORA architecture, it gives you an opening to interact and demonstrate that the Quad is not anti-China because this is how we see it. This is what is projected on the global stage that the Quad came together to, to, uh, to look at containing China 
because of the actions of China, especially in terms of, of sovereignty and territorial integ integrity in, within the South China Sea, within uh, East uh, Sea, and within some of the land masses. Uh, and, and therefore, it's natural for countries to want to have different configurations to address your security needs. So I think demonstrating that you are inclusive in addressing the global challenges, working in partnership with many of us that would like to also address the same challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think let's have two questions. Uh, so uh, maybe here. Is there a mic? Uh, the front door. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sujan Chinoy, a former ambassador to Japan and currently running uh, as DG, India's largest uh, defense and security and IR think tank in the public space, the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. And my observation and question is addressed to Ambassador Anil uh, Suklal, a good friend. I got the impression that you suggested that the US definition of the Indo-Pacific does not include uh, you know, territory up to the east coast of Africa. But I think factually, it does include uh, the expanse of the Western Indian Ocean. And this was clarified by Matt Pottinger a few years ago. Uh, and if you're referring to the, uh, what you call the military commands in terms of US indo pacom or, uh, you know, CENTCOM or AFRICOM, I agree with you. Uh, or if it is in the context of the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, I agree with you. But there does not seem any need to conflate the Quad with the Indo-Pacific here. To the extent that South Africa is interested, like Brazil was, in connecting with the Quad, in a Quad Plus, it's possible to dialogue. So uh, what I'm trying to suggest to you is uh, that the Indo-Pacific itself is quite a flexible concept. Uh, and uh, I would like to hear your views on that. And as far as Haley is concerned, I don't think there is anything wrong in having a quad plus concept because you have a P5 plus one in solving Iran's uh, you know, nuclear issue, or you have ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six. Uh, so it's not really the name that is restrictive at all. The quad two has been consulting countries like Brazil, um, you know, South Korea, the Philippines, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one more question from the back. Hello, I am Nare from Armenia, and I would like highly to answer this question. Uh, can we say that Quad is somehow response to Chinese Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you. So, a Chinese, what kind of initiative? Belt and Road. BRI. Okay. So, who do we want to respond? Uh, who's who's going to start? Maybe Haley? Uh, on the first question, fantastic question. I think uh, the reason why Quad Plus is offensive is to countries in the region that don't want to uh, associate themselves with the Quad because it's become a dirty word. So for Southeast Asian countries in particular, and I'm sure Lynn would have a view on this, um, why would they want to be involved in Quad Plus if that upsets China? So it becomes stigmatised. And so instead of saying Quad Plus, you should just say Australia, India, US, uh, Japan plus, you know, uh, well, Vietnam or any other country. The problem is that there's no shorthand for it and so people in the media will always use Quad Plus. But it does undermine our goal of working more with countries in Southeast Asia. And then to address that lady's question, um, I think Quad came together initially because of a regional disaster. Um, it reformed because India was worried about China on its border because there were increasing Chinese incursions on India's border. And all four countries realised that they had a major challenge on their hands. At the same time, if there was no challenge from China, would these four countries have come together anyway? I think the answer is yes, because there are so many regional challenges and there are so many similarities before, between the four quad countries. But it's not a response to BRI. Um, there's an Australia-US-Japan trilateral infrastructure partnership. It's been around for about five years. The only thing it's done is a couple of undersea cables and that is because it is so difficult to cooperate between so many different governments. Um, 
And I think even the discussion around infrastructure has moved on a little bit because instead of competing with China on infrastructure, which is expensive, timely, um, doing quality controls is difficult, and um, you know China is able to eat our lunch everywhere in the region because it's already built the bridge while we're still talking about it, um, we're actually moving into another era which is all about economic security and US industrial policy. And now we are fighting on new terms that's about export controls and technology controls, which the next session will deal with. And so I wonder if we actually missed the boat on infrastructure um, because China is already there and developing countries need the infrastructure now. And I don't know why um, we can't come to like faster agreement. Well, I do know why I was in government. <laughs> um, maybe can I response from Lin? And also uh, I want to uh, get the comment from the floor. So Lin. Yeah, thanks. I would like to address the question about whether the Quad is a, was a response to China's BRI. As Haley mentioned, um, I, I don't think it, wa uh, it, it wasn't, um, not directly at least. I think the Quad, to my mind, was um, a reaction to or a response to China's actions um, as well as the challenges that it posed to the balance of power in the region as well as the rule of law. Um, but having said that, it's, it wasn't directly a response to China's BRI. I, I do think that uh, countries concerned about China's behavior and about the sort of influence that China will exert on the region need a response to China's BRI. And we've got had various initiatives from the US, from the G7, from Europe. Um, uh, the Quad has attempted bits of it um, to China's BRI, but it's all been very piecemeal, and I think implementation has been weak, if not um, non-existent. I was recently in Laos, and um, what really struck me there was the sort of lack of talk about geopolitics. It wasn't about China or the United States, um, China was just a fact of life. And Laos now has a high-speed rail linking the country to China, and that's benefiting businesses in the region. The, the tourism business has boomed in Laos because of the ability to easily um, uh, take in Chinese tourists, or Chinese tourists can easily travel to Laos. Now that's mainland Southeast Asia, of course, and that you know mainland Southeast Asia has always been more connected to China, but I think we are seeing China make inroads as well to uh, to uh, to maritime Southeast Asia, notwithstanding its actions in the South China Sea. And I can elaborate on that further, but I think that would take up too much time. Yeah, thank you so much. So let me take the comment from the floor. Um, thank you. I just want to uh, comment on some of the observations made by the panelists and uh, some of the participants here. Uh, Quad was. Uh, uh, a framework, as the minister said, that uh, initially uh, was conceived in 2004. And why the second iteration of Quad became much more active and relevant was because of a diverse set of reasons and factors. You know, the minister spoke about converging strategic outlooks among the four countries. And here we saw a pattern of uh, concerns and challenges in the Indian Ocean region in uh, Southeast Asia and also in the Pacific Islands. It was not only because of India's issues on the border uh, you know, uh, with China in uh, Galwan. We saw uh, increasing economic coercion, uh, uh, a, an issue with uh, supply chains being concentrated in a particular geography, uh, debt-induced vulnerability, using financing in order to uh, make countries vulnerable, and related issues such as infrastructure, basing, elite capture, and the entire range of uh, you know, behavior, which uh, includes unilateral actions uh, to upset status quo, uh, violation of international law, and other issues. So it was a wide range of issues which made the Quad in its second iteration a very active platform. Thank you so much. So I think we are just about our time. I, I need to respond to the question Ambassador Chinoy raised. I fully agree with you. The Indo-Pacific is an evolving construct. You have various definitions of it. The USA position I was referring to is recent papers put out by the State Department. And they themselves acknowledge that they've taken their eye off the Indian Ocean. They've left a vacuum there. So when we accuse China of moving into a space, is because we have created space. And I think uh, if you look, and it's, I agree also, you can't conflate Quad and Indo, the Indo-Pacific. They're two different constructs. 
There may be some synergies, but I think it, it would be wrong to, con uh, to conflate the two as, as, as one entity. Uh, uh, we need to be mindful of that. As I've said, for us outside the region, there is still a great deal of suspicion about what the Quad is. And I also agree there need to be much more uh, work done in terms of highlighting the real reason why Quad was created and where Quad is going. The same time, the same needs to be done with the Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific, you can apply the same question. Is it exclusive? It's looking exclusive for us from Africa in terms of what has been happening in the Indo-Pacific space. And as I said, today, you, security is indivisible. It's interconnected. You can't leave one geography out and speak of an emerging construct. China still, and I've engaged China and constantly engaged China. Russia first totally discounted the terminology Indo-Pacific. They didn't want to use it. Russia now it uses the term Indo-Pacific. China has moved because China says, no, what is this Indo-Pacific? There's Asia Pacific. But China is now using the term Asia Indo-Pacific. There's movement on the part of China because the Indo-Pacific is a reality. You can't wash it away. And we have to work within that domain and we have to work with those that don't see it in the same way as we do. But through a process of constant interaction, we need to let them see that this is not a threat to the global community. Having a safe, secure, viable, sustainable Indo-Pacific space is what we all need and want. Thank you. Thank you so much with that. So I think this session itself is serves as the outreach of Quad. So thank you so much. So let's give a big round of applause for the panel. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much.